Plaza Accord. This was in 1985. This was an overnight devaluation of the dollar, which led to a 50% drop overall in the US dollar. To explore that further, let's go back to actual video footage from 1985, where you are gonna see someone that you never thought you would ever see on one of my videos. It's gonna absolutely shock you, so I hope you're sitting down. Okay, let's go back to 1985 here. In the early 80s, the US dollar floated high against the Japanese yen and German Deutschmark, buoyed by the Reagan era combination of tight money and a high budget deficit. Okay, so I want to point out the similarities right there. Tight money and a high budget deficit. Today, we don't have what I would consider tight money, obviously, but we do compared to Japan and Europe where the interest rates are a lot lower. And obviously, we have a massive budget deficit. So two things that are exactly the same now as they were then. That was good news for Japan and Germany because the high dollar meant a low yen in Deutschmark and low prices for Japanese and German exports, more sales and more jobs. But the high dollar was bad news for the U.S. Higher export prices, declining sales, lost jobs, and calls for government protection. Mm, you hear that? Okay, so I'm going to disagree slightly with this because they're just showing the downside to a high dollar. They're not showing the upside, but they start talking about protectionism. And what do we have today? Rhetoric, nonstop rhetoric coming from Washington, DC about protectionism. That's what tariffs are all about. So we've got three of three. We've got tight dollar. We've got massive budget deficits. And we've got a cry for protectionism. As Ronald Reagan's Treasury Secretary, James Baker believed that free markets made their best choices without government interference. But as a practical politician, he knew what would happen if the government politician. failed to act. The United States was um, facing a real prairie fire of, of uh, protectionism. Yeah. There was a lot of protectionist sentiment uh, in the Congress. Uh, legislation was being uh, discussed, if not introduced. And uh, it was our view that uh, something had to be done about that. To head off the threatened protectionism, Baker picked New York's Plaza Hotel as the site for secret monetary diplomacy. A 1985 gathering of finance ministers and central bankers from the G5, the big industrial nation. Their surprise decision, the Plaza Accord, an agreement to sell dollars on worldwide currency markets in an effort to send the dollar and American export prices down. All right, so pay very close attention to that. How did they pull this off? Those countries went into the FX markets, the worldwide FX markets, and they sold dollars that increased the supply of dollars, which took the price of the dollar down. Very important that we remember that. Why would Germany and Japan be willing to give up the advantages of the low Deutschmark and yen? Finance Minister Gerhard Stoltenberg represented Germany at the plaza. Maybe a short term advantages could be endangered when the other important countries, in this case, especially United States, would be negatively affected, especially by a expanding trade deficit, which created tensions also for the other countries. So we wanted a surplus in trade, but not as big as we had when the dollar was more than three Deutschmark. Choi Yu Giyotin was Japan's vice minister of finance at the plaza. Uh, strong dollar made Japanese exports very easy. Uh, and a very large Japanese surplus uh, generated international criticism against Japan. Japan was concerned about those criticisms. The Plaza Accord put the G5 back into the international exchange rate equation. Had they abandoned the policy of market-driven exchange rates? Yes. 
Well, it was essentially uh, a policy change, even though uh, at the time we probably disclaimed uh, the uh, mm. the idea that it was a big policy it's change. So meaning they lied. The dollar had been dropping, and now it dropped faster, down a record 4.29 percent the day after the plaza, down almost 55 percent a year later against the yen. Had the new strategy worked? MIT. <laughs> <laughs> it's Krugman. Oh my gosh, it's Krugman. Oh man, I never ever thought that I would ever see Krugman on one of my videos or put him on one of my videos. Ah, jeez. All right, let's hear what he has to say. Professor Paul Krugman. All the evidence before and since has suggested that intervention on the scale that actually Krugman. took place should not have made very much difference. Uh, the usual experience has been that, that an intervention of the side, the few billion dollars that took place after the Plaza Accord, uh, is something if the market doesn't agree, the market thinks the dollar should be going up and you intervene to try to force it down, the market can swallow $20 billion of intervention with just a slight burp and, and, uh, and then continue on its progress. Uh, so the, the intervention itself probably isn't the explanation. Um, there's a second view, uh, which some people call the slap in the face theory which was that the market was going crazy and the plaza court, the, all these dignified finance ministers got together and said, the dollar is too high, it really should be going down. And the market started going, thanks, I needed that. And the dollar <laughs> started to fall instead. Okay, so I want to point out there that that is our distinguished Nobel Prize winning economist that is so revered. His ideas are so complex that he boils them down to a simple slap in the face and that's what made the dollar go down. Hmm. Unbelievable. The dollar kept falling. And the finance ministers and central bankers were satisfied. So could they do a Plaza Accord 2.0 today? Well, my answer there would be yes and no. Let me explain. Step number two, Plaza Accord 2.0. Could they pull it off today? The U.S. justification for this would be very similar to what it was in 1985. That would be to boost exports, we want to create all those jobs, and it's all about protectionism. Throughout society or in the government, that's the rhetoric. Protectionism, protectionism, protectionism. Of course, the real reason they're doing it is to inflate away the $23 trillion in debt that they actually have. And it makes all of those off-balance sheet liabilities easier to handle. I think the way they would sell this to the United States public, because they'd say, listen guys, well back in 1985, yeah, we devalued by 55%, but inflation didn't go up that much, maybe four to 6%. But the economy back then was much different than it is today. Today, it's much more consumption based. That means that we're more reliant on imports. So as an example, let's use cars. So if we have a lot of different options for cars, if the prices of the Toyotas and the BMWs go up, well, it's not that big of a deal because you can always buy a Ford. And that's how it was in 1985. But now we don't have those options. Of course, we still have them with cars, but go down to your local Walmart or your local Target. How many of those items are made in the United States? Almost zero. So if the prices of those items at Walmart and Target went up substantially, the consumer doesn't have a cheaper choice. They have to absorb the cost. But the inflation that it would create is actually what the US government wants. The big problem that they would run into is Japan, Europe, and China. Now these are the major players and they would not want to play ball. Why? Because they're in the exact position as the United States. They have huge debt and they're trying to do the same thing. They're actually trying to devalue their currency as well. Right now we are in the middle of a currency war, which means all of these countries, the United States, Japan, the European Union, and China are all trying to turn their currency into toilet paper. It's just a race to the bottom. So they're not gonna be willing to go into the FX market 
like Japan and Germany did in the Plaza Accord 1.0 and sell all these dollars and buy back their own currency to lower the value of the dollar because that would increase the price of their currency. And that's the opposite of what they're trying to do because the whole world, at least the developed economies, are all in this currency war. Step number three, the US solution. How would they work around the fact that the European Union, China, and Japan doesn't want to play ball? How would they get to this Plaza Accord 2.0 where they could go in and collapse the dollar? The very first thing they'd have to do is set up capital controls because once the smart money found out that this was the game plan, it would leave the country so fast it would make your head spin. They would do this by going cashless. We've all heard about this. We all know it's coming. So they go to a digital currency, which would create this financial Berlin wall that I always talk about in my videos. Once they trapped that money in the United States, the Fed could go ahead and print limitless amounts of dollars to sell into the FX markets that will lower the price of the dollar. Import prices go up, that means inflation goes up. And this isn't some sort of tinfoil hat conspiracy theory. This has been in the news for months where they've actually been talking about doing this. So is it possible for us to have a Plaza Accord 2.0 today? Not exactly, because these other countries aren't willing to participate. But is it possible for the United States to print up the money, go into the FX market themselves, and proactively collapse the dollar? The answer to that question is yes, absolutely. For more information like this, check out this content right here and I will see you on the next video.